Hi, this is Harold Long. Welcome to the Hill Tran United Weekly Message and Podcast. I'm glad you're making time for this week's teaching. I will have more to say at the end, but for now, let's dive right in. I am excited for our worship service. We're going to start with a hymn. If you would like to sing with us.
builds leaders, inspires us, and helps us move towards Christ in our understanding. And yet, a lot of great fellowships where you can get support, knowledge, with shared stories, and love from each other. And who among us here use that? We have some excellent new study materials available in the Shareware bookcase in the fellowship hall. Come check it out. Bar and return. When it's finished, it's free! <laughs> we want to announce the grand opening of the Family Grounds gift shop. There are many inspirational and cute items available, from devotionals to jewelry, decor, and purses, even some cardinal fan items. Please patronize the gift shop, and all proceeds go back to the church. There's an honor box to take checks and cash. Sorry, we cannot offer any change since the shop is unstaffed. Please come and check it out. There is an excellent opportunity of ministry available to anyone. We need to fill our Sunday coffee ministry calendar with people required to make coffee and purchase donuts for the coffee shop at HUMC. Responsibilities would be to come early 40 minutes to be exact, not on seated tables where people wait. To make coffees, put on chairs and donuts set in our fridge, round corner table. Non seated tables where people might want to sit and clean up afterward. If you want to have a Sunday or two, whatever, we would appreciate the effort. As of now, we have no sign ups. This service is a great way to show hospitality. The registration is now open for our Heartland, Heartland Traveling VBS Camp is coming through to HUMC June 14th through 18th, 2021. This camp is for kindergarten through sixth grade. We can take up to a maximum of 70 kids. Please see the bulletin website, your email, or our private Facebook group for more information on how to register your children. You can pay online through our online giving platform. Please choose Heartland Camp in the drop down menu when selecting where to give. Please bring a piece of luggage next week to be used as part of the message. Now for our call to worship. We are called to be God's children. God's love has been born our lives through Jesus Christ. Fear and doubt are gone. Joy and celebration ring in our hearts. Come, let us come, let us raise our voices in song. Let us offer our hearts and souls to God in prayer and praise. tells us, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, 
who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. You may be asking why I'm mentioning this verse as we prepare to receive our morning offering. That verse is not about money. The reason is we serve a generous God who loves us and wants to meet us where we are. And where we are is we need his wisdom. We lack it, so we are asking. And this moment is a time to praise him because he wants too much give to give us the wisdom to deal with everything facing us right now. See, when you give, your resources are leveraged in our community so that we are a solution to those who are hurting. I hear it so often. Michelle, I don't even want to think about where our community would be without Hillsborough United Methodist Church. Whenever I hear that statement, I always tell that person about you. You are. You are the ones who make our community ministry happen. Your gener generosity in serving allow us to help the partnerships with our schools, feeding programs, Christmas baskets, and dinners. Your kindness is what makes serving the poor and under-resourced in our community possible in the first place. So I thank you for your consistent and faithful giving. I want to add a request today. I still want you to give extravagantly. It does change people's lives. It does change people's lives. Let me correct that. But I also want you to pray for wisdom and ask God to give extravagantly to everyone in our community. Right now, we need it just as much. Thank you again. It is an honor to be your missionary and ambassador to our community. You are deeply loved and a solution to what our nation, state, county, and cities are facing. God bless. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that we live in the dispension of grace and that we are not under the old law of the spirit of death, but the new law of the spirit of life. But Lord, we feel called to give tithe to you because we love you, and we want to do this as a thank offering for the grace and love you have shown towards our kingdom community. Except we pray the small token of our love and gratitude for loving us enough to give. Your life for us and die a cruel death on the cross that we may live and for paying the debt we could not pay, and then clothing us in the righteousness of Christ and honor which we give you with all the glory. Thank you, Lord, for the amazing grace and steadfast love and mercy that you have poured out on us. You have done so much in abundance. Please help us never to become complacent or lukewarm towards you. You, but rather to live in personal awe and wonderment for the gift of life that you give, have given us as a gift of grace and by our, by our simple faith in Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please. 
when I signed Lila up for Vacation Bible School, there was uh, 70 people are allowed to come, and there's 68 people allowed to come left. So it's Lila and one other person. <laughs> so please sign your kids up, grandkids, whoever, neighbors, friends. So starting with our scripture, Acts 3, chapters 12 through 19. Seeing this, Peter, Peter addressed the people. You Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why are you staring at us as if we made him walk by our own power and piety? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus. This is the one who handed over and denied in Pilate's presence, even though he had already decided to release him. You rejected the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you instead. You killed the author of life, the very one whom God raised from the dead. We are a witness of this. His name itself has been made this man strong. That is, because of faith in Jesus' name, God has strengthened this man whom you see and know. The faith that comes through Jesus gave him complete help right before our eyes. Brothers and sisters, I know you acted in ignorance. So did your rulers. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets. That th his Christ would suffer. Change your hearts and lives. Turn back to God so that your sins may be wiped away. May God bless your hearing, understanding, and application of the scripture. You can be seated. Good morning, friends. Sunny day, rain's gone, amen? We uh, had a, uh, the no bands are gone, as you can tell, we drove around back. You can see the RVs are long gone. But if you haven't had a chance just to go around, walk through the church, walk through the grounds, and walk around the parsonage and look at everything that they've done and accomplished in three weeks, it's pretty amazing. So I think, even though they're not here, I think it's amazing work and commitment on their part. So our church looks a whole lot different, a whole lot better because of uh, their dedication. So we get praise for that. There was a guy who asked his friends, he asked him, he said, what is the difference between ignorance and apathy? And the guy says, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> and so that's the world we live in today. And, and this is the title of our message is Ignorance is Bliss and Wake Up America. And, and uh, you know, we really haven't talked a lot about where we are as a country and where we are as a state at this point in time. I haven't really did a lot of messages around this. But today I wanted to just lift it up and, and not ignore it because this is what happens in culture. Is we, if it doesn't pertain to me right here, right now, then it's like it doesn't exist. It's like we turn a blind eye to what's going on in the world. So, and, and so our scripture today just really pushes back against that. 
that you can't claim ignorance. As kingdom people, we can no longer claim ignorance that we don't know what it means to live the kingdom life, what it means to follow Jesus. We, we can't hang our hat on that. And even though there's different interpretations out there of, of trying to uh, live out the Christian life and what it means to be Christian, we're going to unpack that today and we're going to talk about that in a big way because I think it's important as kingdom people, as people that are going to live out this faith, to really know what you're up against from unbelievers, from people that don't subscribe to your way of being, push back against you, and how do you respond to that? And so we, I just want to lift that up today. I want to talk about, you know, uh, what came out of that, what comes out of a lot of the Christian movement, just war, holy wars. I want to talk about that for a little bit. And then I want to talk about what it means to live the kingdom life in the context that we're in today. And so I want to just bring this to light. So it, it'll press you a little bit in the beginning, but, but hopefully, I mean, the message is, is that we can just get recommitted to what it means to live a Jesus-looking life, to worship a Jesus-looking God, and to live that life. And it means a heck of a commitment. And it means going against the status quo, what you see out there in the world today. And it's not easy. I mean, I'll be the first to admit, it's not easy to live the kingdom life. But this is what we're called to do. So that's what I want to dive in this morning. So here are some of the headlines from this past week. You've probably seen some of these on the news or read them in a paper. Pope Francis asked Minnesota Bishop to resign following Vatican probe regarding sexual abuse and cover-up. This is one of the big things that came out of the week. Minnesota police officer Kim Potter, who shot and killed uh, Dante Wright during a traffic stop, resigns. These are just the headlines of the week. Eight killed in Indianapolis FedEx shooting. Suspect no confrontation with anyone, police said. I'm just taking these from the headlines. Derek Chauvin murder case, day 15. See, these are the things that cop fired after pepper spray spraying an army lieutenant. I don't know if you saw that video, but that was a heart-wrenching, heartbreaking video to watch uh, somebody who's given up their life to serve our country, and that's what they had to go through. That's an experience that nobody here, other than maybe Chloe, will ever experience, and that's just the reality. Um, we drive around all the time and it's not a big deal. We don't have that apparently. But to watch the fear of this guy when he got pulled over and they said, step out of your car, and he says, I'm afraid to get out of my car. And you could see it on his face. He was absolutely terrified for his life. And so think about that in the culture that we live in. And this is where we can't, you know, this is where the ignorance, we can't claim ignorance anymore to this. So we, we just have to see it for what it is. And a lot of this is done in the name of Jesus, friend. That's the hard part. That's the hard part about Christianity sometimes and faith. It's not just Christianity, but it's just faith in general. So many people justify their actions because this is what I believe God would do. This is what I believe God would respond to this. And so we can't hang on to that. So today I want to talk about these three things. Transparent Christian history, just wars, holy wars, and what it means to live the kingdom life. This is the part of it that I really want to get into today and for us to think about. And so I want to go back to our scripture. I want you to really pay attention to what Peter and the disciples are saying to the early Christians, the Gentiles and the Jews that are there in this moment. This is what they're saying to them. Because this is the people, the, these are the people that were ignorant. He's given them a pass. He's given them grace. This is their ignorance when it came to who Jesus was. This is God incarnate. This was the Son of God in your presence. And this is how you treated him. And this is what you did to him. Listen to what it says. Seeing this, Peter addressed the people. You Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why are you staring at us as if we made him walk by our own power and piety? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus. This is the one he handed over and denied in Pilate's presence, even though he had already decided to release him. Pilate already said he's free to go. I don't, I'm not going to wash my blood on this guy's hands. Just let him go. But they wouldn't have it. They rejected the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released, released to you instead. Barabbas. You know, and they screamed it as far as scripture goes. You killed the author of life. Think about that. The very one whom God raised from the dead. You are witnesses of this. And so I think it's important to know that you are witnesses to this. You saw it for your own eyes. This isn't some secondhand story or third party story. You witnessed it. You watched it, friends. This is why we can put so much faith in scripture because there's eyewitness testimony to what happened. His name himself has been made the man strong. This guy, Peter, as he talks about. That is because of faith in Jesus' name. God has strengthened this man whom you see and know. The faith that comes through Jesus gave him complete health right before your eyes. You've seen this transformation in myself. You've seen who I was, what I was like before the cross and resurrection. You see what my life is today after the resurrection. There's no doubt about it. I can give all the glory to God. That's what he gives. 
Brothers or sisters, listen to what he says. I know you acted in ignorance. So did your rulers. But this is how God fulfilled what he foretold all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer. Change your hearts and lives. Turn back to God so that your sins may be wiped away. That is the scripture in the heart of the, today's message as we go into it. So transparent Christian history. And so if you were asked, sit down with some, just a friend, a co-worker, golfing buddy, hunting buddy, fellow friend, asked you, what is the history of Christianity? What does it look like? What kind of picture would you paint? Would it be a glorious one? Would it be an awesome one? Would it be a triumphant one? What would it be? Because there's what you would paint, and then there's also reality. And this is where it, you know, ignorance is bliss. This is where we turn a blind eye. We're, we're so many kingdom people really don't want to resonate. They only want to reflect on where we came from and the things that happened to get us to where we're at. And, and so we just want to turn a blind eye to this. But I can tell you the unbelievers out there don't. And some of them know this history better than you do. And they know your Bible better than you do. And they will use it against you. And they will press back against you. And so how do you deal with that? Well, I think the first thing is you got to know the history of this. So we're not going to go into some big, deep history lesson, but this is the reality of where we got to and where we're at in the name of Jesus. In the founding of America, the Spanish Inquisitions, the, the Crusades, the extermination of the Native Americans that were here. This is all reality. It's all fact-based stuff. Um, and then he had the Atlantic State Trade, which over 12 million people were stolen from their country. Just ripped off and stolen and brought here for free labor around the world. And, uh, and it happened for 400 years. Think about that. For 400 years this, this went on. And in some context, you can argue that some of it's still, the remnants of some of it's still going on today. That's where social justice would push back. And a lot of people would say, you bet it's going on, systemic racism around the clock. But again, if it's not affecting me, it's easy to turn a blind eye to this. And this is the challenge that we all face as kingdom people. But this is the reality. People that are going to press you are going to point to this. And a lot of people don't come to faith or walk away from the faith because of this truth in their life. And so how do you deal with that? And I think as kingdom people, the way you deal with it is you have to own it. Call it what it is. Yes, it is. But that's not why Jesus came. That is the good news. Jesus didn't come for that. Whatever that is, that's just the world that got completed, that polluted with the kingdom life. But that is not Jesus. And anybody that says it is, is just wrong. You know what I'm telling you? I'm just telling you, it's just wrong. It's not what this life is about. And that's not what the kingdom message is. So I, when people press me, I'm going to go, you're right. And I'll be honest with you, I side with the unbeliever than the, more than the Christian apologetic when it comes to this most of the time. Because they're right. So I said, you're right, but that's not the true message of Jesus. That's not why Jesus came. So let's really talk about what Jesus came for. What does it mean to live the kingdom of life? But we can't deny, we can't play ignorance and bliss, pretend this isn't what it is, or this is some left-wing, you know, excursion or exaggeration of the truth. It's the truth. Do your own research. Do your own homework. You don't need me to do it. Just do it yourself. These are hardcore facts. This is the truth. And it was ugly. I mean, especially the Crusades in those times, they persecuted heretics, they burned people alive, and they tortured people. And the torture is way past rated R or X, triple X rated. You can Google medieval torture to find out what it looked like to what they did in the name of Jesus to a lot of people. All professed Christians were doing this kind of stuff. It's the worst evil in history, period, as far as I'm concerned. And it was all done in the name of God, all done in the name of Christianity. And so you wonder why some people, why people struggle with the idea of being a Christian or living a kingdom life. And especially people of color. It still baffles me today how some people of color even came to faith. The way that God was presented to them and the way it was shoved down their life and the way they were forced to live this life. And so this is the realities of our life. Now the good news is we can change all that. We don't have to subscribe to it. But what we can't do is play ignorance and bliss like this never happened. Like it was never part of our life. And this is what a lot of people do. It's like, well, that's old news. That's past. Well, okay, but what's the past? Do you even know where we came from? This is why you got 80 different churches in Hillsborough. Friends, this is it. This is how it all started. So we'll talk about that for a second. So you have Christendom, which is almost dead. That's the militant, triumphant church comes in and tells you how you're going to do Christ. This is how you're going to do church, regardless of what culture. I remember reading one African leader, I can't remember his name, but his quote was simply this, that when the white people came here, we had the land and they had the Bible. And when they left, we had the Bible 
and they had the land. You know, think about that. All in the name of Jesus. They got hustled out of all kinds of stuff. In the name of God. That doesn't mean all. And there's a great kingdom people that were through all these ages really trying to live the kingdom life. So I'm not downplaying that. But they were definitely the minority. And they were oppressed against, like I promise you, even against the institutional church. So the ecclesia, the real church, the first century church, the church that really existed in the first century through fourth century, was all about Christ's likeness. We're going to live like Christ. We're going to be like Christ. And when you look at Christ and you think about it, Turn another cheek. Be a peacemaker. Yeah, don't do evil against those who do evil to you. You're going down the line of all the attributes of Jesus Christ. You don't see any of that in Jesus, but yet a lot of these people were out there doing the opposite. They were ultimately the Antichrist. What is the Antichrist? Anybody that's creating atrocities, going to war, hurting other people in the name of Jesus is the Antichrist. Because that's not Jesus, friends. If it is, I will give you a month and I'll give you the Bible and you can have this whole platform and you can come up here and preach it. And you preach it, and you, you, you convince me that that's how Jesus, who he was, and what he was all about. Because you can't do it. But I'll give you the platform if you think you can. Because you can. And so, wherever you're at on your spiritual journey when it comes to being a kingdom person, being a professed Christian, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord, my Savior. And Jesus as Lord is a really big deal, friends. It's the center of who our life is as kingdom people. So if we're going to live this life, then we really need to live it. And if we live it in the culture that we live in today, you're going to have pushback. And here's the reality. You can have harmony with God and friction with others, or you can have friction with people and harmony with God, but you can't have it both ways. If you're going to live the kingdom life, it's going to be a challenge sometimes. But there's no better way to live. It's a blessed way to live. But you're going to be pushed back. You're going to suffer from it. So then came the just for it there. Where did that come from? That came from St. Augustine of Hippo. And where did that come out of? That came out of the 4th century when the, fourth, when the church formed an alliance with the state. When Constantine said Christianity is going to be the, the official religion of the state and the church got rich and the church got powerful and they got prestige and they got glory and they've never been able to come back from it. That's the truth of where we're at today. That's why you've got 80 different churches around here, friends. It's because of that power, that glory, and that prestige that exists and it was given to them. That was, Then this is what happened as a result because they were in alliance with the, with the governments and the powers and the empire of the time. And the empire wanted to go do things. They come to the church and say, how can we do this? How can we have a just war? How can we have a holy war in the name of God? And this little outline right here, comparative justice, legitimate authority, right intention, probability of success, last resort. This was the litmus test. This was a test that had to go through to see if we were justified to go to be destructive to other people or take their land or fight back and press against. This is where it all came out of. And we don't have time to break into those, but that was the process for for a just war, a holy war. And so we do this stuff still today, all over the place. And little bitty, there's little bitty remnants of it, and there's great big exposure. We're doing this in the name of God. God is behind us, God blesses this, and I'm telling you, in Scripture, you can't prove that. And so as kingdom people, what do you do with that when we live in a culture that just says we can do this and we can do it in the name of God? God's on our side. I, I just don't see it. You know, and this is, I had to wrestle and unpack all this stuff as a kingdom person. This is John Wesley, the founder of Wesley, as a Methodism. This is his original statement, reproach to all reason and humanity as it relates to war. That's quote number one. Quote number two, fighting war is forgetting God. Now this is what he said, but he was very much a proponent, not I want to say very much, but he was, in his own way, was a proponent of the just war clause. Even John Wesley was. And, and I don't think he would be today, as time went on as he matured, that he would be. And the Methodist church totally took a different position on it. But, but that's where it came from. He was influenced by the culture and the times. That this is what it is. But I'm telling you, Jesus would push back hard on all this. And so this is the, the United Methodist social principle that comes out of the book of this one. This was changed in 1972, and this is what it still reads today. We believe that war, you can just put violence, is incompatible with the teachings of an example of Christ. Amen. And I think that's right. That is the example. It's incompatible. Any kind of violence or any pushback against that would be incompatible with that. So we get into kingdom living. So how do you live the kingdom life in the world system that we live in? Not just in America, but around the world that does not live along these lines. How do you do that? So Galatians, this is well the first century, so that first century to that fourth century, this is the original Christian kingdom communities. This is how people live. Listen to what it says. This is really important. I wish this was tattooed on all of our foreheads. 
For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. We're all children of God. As many of you as were baptized in Christ have clothed yourself in Christ. Now listen to what it says. There is no longer Jew or Greek or Jew or Gentile. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. All of you are one in Jesus Christ. You're one person. You're one body. This was the message from the beginning. Why do we have any different churches within 10 miles of us, if that's true? And see, that's what we have to wrestle with. So how do we get back to this universal Catholic? And I don't mean Catholic in the faith itself, but Catholic meaning universal. How do we get back to the universal church, to where we walk shoulder to shoulder with all the body of Christ doing the work in the kingdom? Because just think of all the churches got together. Seriously, if all the churches got together, we pulled our resources, our time, our talent, treasures together, what we could do in Jefferson County. It would blow your socks off. But you got Hillsboro down here trying to do their thing. You got Hillsboro Christian Church up there trying to do their thing. And you got the, the, the church next door, the Holy Living Word, trying to do their thing. And on down the road. And, and then Hillsboro Baptist and the Latter-day Saints. And just go on down the line. All these churches trying to do a little bitty job. And they try to do it. And we do it as best we can. But man, if we could do it together, how powerful it would be. And just think if you took that to the world. Because just to Christians alone, if we just gave up 10% of what we offer, we could end world hunger like that. That fast. But this is the stuff that the Bible is. And Jesus was telling us from day one. Old Testament scripture, God speaking through the prophets, was telling us from day one. This is not kingdom living. And if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So if you're a person of Christ, regardless of your skin color, regardless of which side of the railroad tracks, regardless of where you went to high school, regardless of what zip code you live in, you're part of this body. But because of isms and because of phobias that exist in every one of us, that's just not the case. Again, we can turn and play ignorance, or we can say it's not so, but it's the truth. And so how do you wrestle with that? And so these are all things as kingdom people have to wrestle for. So there's just tons of scripture that point to this. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Psalm 34, 14. He shall judge between the nations. He shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords and plowshares and their spears and pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Isaiah 2.4. This is the heartbeat of who God is. This is what he's trying to tell the people of the world at that time. This is my will for everyone. Something, one of those who was with Jesus, put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave, the high priest, and cutting off his ear. Matthew 26. Then Jesus said to him, listen to what Jesus said, put your sword back in your place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. This is who we follow, friends. How do you get any kind of violence from that? But I say to you, do not resist any evildoer, but if an evildoer or anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other awesome. I mean, that's hard. What does that even mean? And these are challenging verses. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And if you live in a kingdom of life, you're going to be persecuted, maybe even by your own family, definitely by the culture that we live in. You're going to be persecuted. They may not say it in front of you, but they're going to give you trouble behind your back, I can promise you. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So if you're a child of God, you are called to be a peacemaker. Period. There's no work around with that. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Typically, in a typical Sunday service, right when we start, we would say, hey, let's have a peace offering. Let's welcome the neighbor, whatever. We stand up and we hug and slap. And now we just do holy high fives. You know, we just, that's all they can do because of COVID. But listen to what it says. Peace I leave to you, my peace I give to you. I do not give you as the world does. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let, let uh, them be afraid. You know, because you're going to face stuff. But have peace. Know that you're with. I'm with you. The Holy Spirit is with you. Regardless of how troubling it may be, have peace. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. To which indeed we are called to what? One body. We're called to one body. And be thankful for that. So this is the calling on the kingdom life. To have one heart, to have one body, and to be at peace with each other. Loving one another. Helping others get what they need. Not because they deserve it, but because they need it. Amen? That's what we're called to be. It's not easy to do, but together we can do it. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
That is the powerhouse. There's no defense against love. It's the truth. You got friction in your life, there's no defense. I can love you and there's nothing you can do about it, Gene. You know, even though you're wearing a Buckeyes thing, I still love you and there's nothing you can do about it. God bless you. Don't repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse, but on the contrary, listen, on the contrary, repay with a blessing. It is that, it is for this that you are called, that you might inherit a blessing. So you want to live a blessed life? Be a blessing to others. That's the bottom line. That's the calling on our life. Be them blessed, which I have, which I hope you have, and be a blessing to others. Don't be contrary to that. Here's the bottom line. Agape love, unconditional love, God's love should be shown unconditionally to everyone, family, friends, strangers, and enemies. Jesus taught love, compassion, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Jesus said love and forgiveness was the way to overcome hatred. For most Christians, how can loving someone be injustice or ignoring their needs or killing them more? How can that even begin to align with what a godly love looks like? It just doesn't. It's a huge disconnect. The sanctity of life. All people are made in the image of God and loved by God. Genesis 1. This suggests that injustice, ignoring the cries for help, and killing are wrong because it involves taking away a life that has been planned for, been made, and loved by God. Every single human being is a child of God. And when I start to see that way, it changes everything. But if I allow my history, if I allow my ego, if I allow my privilege to place me in a place where I'm above other people, it's a dangerous place to be. You know what? It is. And as a king of people, we have no excuse for that. We can't play ignorance this now. And so if you're caught there, if you're struggling with that, if you find yourself doing that, then just pray for God to release you from that. To free you from the ism and the phobias and the stuff that's got you trapped in that bondage of self. To where you feel somehow or another you're righteous. Somehow or another you're above other people. And sometimes we just flat dehumanize people. I mean, you don't think so? How many times have you just walked by somebody who needs something? Somebody standing there asking for a dollar or standing at the, at the stop sign and the stoplight when you get off and you just easily just pretend they're not even there. And, and it's not that you're just ignoring them, but you're almost pretending they're not even human. And that's hard to accept that in your heart but when you do that kind of stuff. But I had to be convicted of it many times, friends. I'm not judging. I'm just saying. It's the conviction that I had to go through as a kingdom person to deal with all the junk. And most of the junk I didn't ask for. I don't even know where it all came from, but I had it. So how do we unpack it? This is the whole thing Jesus was trying. That's why he spent three years with these disciples. Trying to teach them these lessons. To what it means to live the kingdom life. It wasn't just a 30 minute seminar. It was three years poured into their life. Of this is how you live the kingdom life. And in the beginning, for the first four decades, they, I mean the first four centuries, they lived it out pretty, pretty solidly. But then we got, in, we got in with the world. We got into the world system. And it corrupted everything. And so as kingdom people, it even starts as a small little cell. But we have to be divorced from the world system. Jesus said, you've you got to be in the world, but don't be of it. And so that's just a personal inventory of your own. How much of the world is in me? How much of the world controls everything I say and do and think and react and respond to life? Or is scripture and the way Jesus lived his life the thing that's pulling my life? So that's the, that's the personal inventory. Only you can take it. I can't take that for you. I have to take my own inventory. But you have to take it and then you have to own it. And if it doesn't align with the kingdom life, then I'm going to ask you to surrender to it. Ask God to remove you from it. Ask God to forgive you from it. And just try to live into this kingdom life. And for some people, that's going to be a huge 180. From the left to the right or to the right to the left or wherever you're at. To get in this kingdom life, which isn't a part of the world system. That's the revelation. It's not part of the world system. I'm just telling you. You cannot show it to me in scripture where the good news lines up. If you want to find out where it really went on, go home and read Samuel, 1 Samuel 8. 1 Samuel 8 will tell you exactly where it all went south. When the people of the Old Testament said, Lord, we no longer want you to be Lord. We want you to give us an earthly king. That's what we want. We want an earthly king. Just like every other nation. We want an earthly king. And what do you tell Samuel? Go tell him that if this is what they want, this is what's going to happen. And he outlines, outlines it in detail. This is exactly what's going to happen. They're going to take your children. They're going to take your money. They're going to put your people in war. And they're going to do these things to your people. Is that really what you want? And they said, we want an earthly king. So give them what they want. And that's what we've had ever since, friends. 
And that's and if you go back and read 1 Samuel 8 and apply it to 2021 in the world, it fits like a glove. Exactly how God said it would be. And so this is where we can trace these roots back in history to where all this stuff went south. So as kingdom people, our job is to make the Lord, yes, God, be the Lord of my life. Not the world system. Not the president. Not the mayor. Not the governor. I want Jesus to be the Lordship of my life and help me live into that each and every day. And if we do that one day at a time, as a kingdom community, we can start to make a dent. We might have to look back at long periods to see the progress, but we can make a dent, friends, I promise you. And lastly, it's this promise, and I'll ask everybody to rise, and I'll ask the band to come back. <coughs> this is our calling. This is our call to action as kingdom to each and every one of us. Change your hearts and lives. Turn back to God so that your sins may be wiped away. That's what we're called to do. Amen? Each and every one of us. This is the kingdom calling in our life. And uh, we need each other to do that. God created us for relationship, friends. Um, in the uh, handout is a connect card. If uh, you've never connected, I just encourage you to fill this out and put it into the basket or the bucket back there. Or you can reach out to me on the line. But if you're struggling in your spiritual life or you never really ask God into your heart and would like to do that or would like to talk about that, I would love to have that conversation with you. And that's just how you can do it. You can reach out to me or put it in, in the connection card. We'd love to do that. So with that, let's pray, friends. Lord, thank you for our message today. It's hard to look at human frailty. It's hard to look at history that was brutal and ugly, and it was done in your name. And none of us here can sit and say, if I were back in that period, I wouldn't have behaved that way. None of us are that grandiose to, to say that. All we can say is, Lord, we live in the now, the 21st century. And we know we're breaking and broken, and we know we're flawed, and we know that this kingdom life is not really too closely followed by a lot of people who claim to be your disciples. And so, Lord, as kingdom people, we want to be authentic. We want to live the kingdom life every way we can. And we know that evil and violence and hatred and ugliness is not part of your kingdom way. So, Lord, all of us have some hostility. All of us have some junk. All of us have hurts, habits, and hang-ups that block us from living this kingdom life out in the, in the fashion that you would have us, Lord. So we just pray that you divorce us from that. Help us live into your calling on our life one day at a time, not to be concerned with what others say, but only be concerned with what you think about what we're doing and how we're living as individuals, as a community, as a big seed church, Lord, as the ecclesia. We pray this boldly in your son's name. And all God's people said, amen. amen.
left to be encouraged. And we all have a long way to go. All say, amen. We're just broken people. We're just trying to do our best. But as kingdom people, we really got to be committed to knowing that we're resurrection, praising the resurrected Jesus for the life that we have. To have victory over death is definitely a spiritual death. And to have victory over the power of sin in our life is such good news, and that's what we have to share. So, wherever you're on your journey, I hope you know that's the truth. Let's share in this benediction together. Go in courage and peace, proclaiming. Come on, man. <laughs> what are you doing to us, brother? Come, on, Chris. come back, come back. Thanks, I didn't know. There we go. Yeah. Erase, erase. Here we go again. Go in courage and peace, proclaiming the risen Lord to all. Be those who bring hope and justice to a hungry and hurting world. The peace of the Lord is with you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, everybody. Have a blessed week. Hi again, this is Harold. Thanks for listening to our weekly message and podcast. I hope that we have shared something helpful to you wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Just so you know a little bit more about us, we are Hill Tran United. Hill Tran United is an alliance between Hillsboro United Methodist Church and Transformation United Methodist Church. We are kingdom churches and kingdom communities for people who aren't into church. We meet Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. at Hillsboro United Methodist Church and 11 a.m. at Transformation United Methodist Church. Both churches are located in the northeastern tip of the beautiful Ozark Mountains, located in Jefferson County, Missouri. We also meet during the week in smaller groups that we call life groups and home churches, and that's how we make it relational. We hear regularly from people from all over who are engaging in personal and group studies based on our teaching, and we would love to know if that is happening where you are at. If you want to connect with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Vimeo, and YouTube, or you can download our app from your favorite app store. Just search for the app titled Our Church by Church Dev and enter in Hilltran United, and you can access all of our available audio, video teachings, plus through the app you can, in our, or our website, you can download our PowerPoint slides, bulletin, sermon notes, and discuss the questions. It's all there for you. And lastly, if you want to learn more about how you can support Hillsboro United Methodist Church or Transformation United Methodist Church financially, please go to www.hilltran.org for more information and to give. We appreciate anything you can do to help. Hey, thanks for being a member of this extended church family. I'm glad we are in this together as kingdom people commencing shoulder to shoulder to help people rediscover life and experience the kingdom of God.